Hi, this is Karis, and welcome to the Launch School podcast. I have Chris here with me. Hey, Chris, how are you? Hey, thanks for having me on again. I feel like we just spoke not too long ago yeah. about the podcast. <laughs> That's true. Not too long ago, but it's really great to have you with us again. So today we'll be talking about Launch School's new Capstone Salaries page. Then I'll close the episode out with some announcements that you should be aware of. And of course, everything that we'll talk about today can be found in the show notes. But for now, let's get into our Capstone Salaries page discussion. Because we're discussing the page in depth, it might be a good idea to have it open as you listen to this podcast episode. And you can find the page at launchschool.com forward slash salaries. So if you're looking to have more clarity around the start of your career in the software industry, Chris will be sharing all kinds of data to look out for on our new salaries page, especially when comparing other career launching programs out there on the market. Use this discussion and also the article that's connected with the salaries page as a companion guide to the page to help you decide if Capstone is right for you. So, Chris, my first question for you is what were some of the main reasons behind the salaries page update? Yeah, I think one of the main reasons is there's this controversy, I suppose you can call it that, in terms of how the industry reports numbers, meaning like a education institution may report one set of numbers to prospective students and report a different metric to maybe investors or to another group. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it brought a lot of discussion about what do these numbers mean? And so I wanted to move away from leading with one percentage or one sentence. Um, And our style is to show people more. I think the type of students we attract tend to not be overwhelmed by numbers. They want to see more rather than less. Yeah. They want to see reasons rather than marketing messages. Yes. Uh, And so I just wanted to take that approach, which is decrease the marketing, right? And sure. like, oh, look, 100% of our students get jobs. And it's like, what, what do you mean by 100%? What do you mean by students? How do you calculate that fraction? Yeah. And so that's really the main impetus behind the redesign. Yeah. Um, and also just wanted to show more data. We have a lot of data to show. Right. And I believe people can make their own decisions. So almost making it not quite like a spreadsheet, but that was definitely an inspiration, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So now that we're not relying on these single sentences or percentages anymore, I was wondering what figures on the page give us a good idea of how successful the year was. I think it really comes down to how do we construct that one sentence, the marketing sentence that training institutions kind of rely on, like logical, we rely on something like some percent of our graduates get jobs with an average salary of whatever the salary is. Yeah, And even just coming up with numbers for that sentence is really, really tricky. Yeah. Uh, and so the article was written to, again, just show people how a sentence like that will come about, mm-hmm. right? And the easy example that I gave an article was 100 students enroll in the program, 50 graduate, then 40 get jobs. Yeah. What do you put on the marketing page, right? Do you yeah. put 80% or do you put 40%? Yes. And if I'm thinking from a student's perspective, I would guess that they're thinking about What are my chances of success if I enroll? Mm. So in other words, 40%. Right. Yes. Whereas schools will sometimes only list the graduate placement Mm. percent, not the enrolled placement percent. I see. And so I think there's a little bit of um, slate of hand here. And I don't want to play that game. I don't want to lead with a percent and be accused that law school is playing that game. Mm. And for what it's worth... Launch schools always use enrolled as the denominator there. Yeah. It never even occurred to me that one should use the graduate number as the sure. denominator. So in the article, you know, I call this sort of like decreasing the denominator game. Yeah. That, that one can play. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So again, if you want to say 80% of graduates get jobs. Yes. But hint, hint, you know, only 50% graduate, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> you can continue to redefine what graduation means Mm -hmm. to decrease the denominator. So instead of 40 out of 50, you can say 40 out of 45. All of a sudden, that's 89%. How do you get to 45? Well, you would add some additional criteria for what it means to graduate. Yeah, yeah. And so you can kind of continue to do this, right? You can continue to do this and push that number to almost whatever you want it to be. Not quite whatever you want it to be, but it can range quite a bit. Like in our in our example here, it's ranging from 40% to 89%. That is a big, big difference yeah. uh, in, in terms of marketing. Yes. Uh, and again, that's why for Capstone, we're just like, going to show you all the numbers, yeah. right? <laughs> and we're going to show you, say a percent, and we'll tell you exactly what the numerator and denominator is. Mm-hmm. And if you 
don't think that's a fair percent, then you can come up with your own percent mm-hmm. and, and use whatever number you think is uh, valuable for your decision making. Yeah. And I think that's really important. And that's what we want to lead with. Yeah, absolutely. And just having that understanding that, you know, looking at other schools and just making sure that you're looking at the right numbers. It's just a very interesting point and something that all students should be aware of or future students that are interested in this. I think it's it's good to just at least think about it from the school side. If you're if you're a prospective student, think about it from the school side. How do they report numbers? Yes. And at least think about it. And I think the article gives you a mental framework for at least thinking about it. Absolutely. We don't know what you don't know. And we're just hoping that when we look at institutions that what they say is true, but it could be skewed. Don't know. So um, another thing that I noticed on the page is that it indicates average salaries. Are these figures based on total compensation or is it based on base salary only? Yeah, this is another part of the puzzle, right? The second part. First part is some percent of our students get jobs with a salary of this, right? So in compensation, you have your base salary. Yes. Which for the most part, that's it. But if you sometimes work for these startups, they'll give you equity as well. Yeah. And especially if the equity is of a public company, then you can actually sell it after a year. And sometimes it could be a quite a big variance. Yeah. Um, it could be a high percent of the base salary. So how is the compensation reported? I think this discussion came about really looking at the income share agreements. Yes of different schools where there are certain income share agreements that look at one's tax returns, okay, which is not well beyond your base salary, Mm -hmm. including bonuses and raises and even side income through like consulting and contracting, right? Yes. That could be a big difference compared to just like one's base salary, right? So obviously in our reporting, you know, when we think about this, like, should we report total compensation? Right. Because yeah. not every capstone grad gets a job where they have, you know, stock yes. or equity or signing bonuses, sure. but some do. Yeah. And so how do we represent that? Um, well, right now we don't. <laughs> we only represent base salary. Err on the side of being more student friendly, if you will. Right. Yeah. So a lot of our choices are kind of like that. It's just like err on the side of underrepresenting versus overrepresenting the compensation mm-hmm. numbers. Yeah. Right. So that's why we look at base salary only. And, you know, our income share agreement is also just base salary only. Yeah. I mean, wow, that's that's really impressive. Thank you for for sort of elaborating on that. Another thing that I also noticed on the page is the average duration to accepted offer. It's a feature. So I was just wondering what makes this figure so important to potential capstone students? In my opinion, this is one of the most important numbers or maybe the most important number to look at because I think it's a number that most accurately reflects whether a training program is doing its job in terms of getting people job ready. In the extreme example we mentioned in the article is suppose you have like a two-day training program yes, with a 12-month job hunt. Uh-huh. Yep. Conceivably, you could have a marketing slogan that says two-day training results in a $100,000 salary. Right. And yeah. what's doing the heavy lifting there is the, is the long duration mm. because you're pushing the learning to the job hunt, but then marketing the two day training lace. Yes. Yeah. Right. Whereas most of the learning is happening during a job hunt. So in my opinion, a short duration to accept an offer is paramount is the most important thing yeah. because it, it reflects the training. Yes. Um, and m- my hope is that you don't have to push learning to the job hunt. Yes. Right. Uh, otherwise, what's the point of learning? Yeah. And the other thing is like long school, you know, for us, when we report numbers, we put duration to accepted offer, mm-hmm. not when the offer is given only because, again, just err on the side of reporting a longer number rather than a shorter number. Yeah. Yeah. Because there is a little bit of fuzziness there yes. in terms of like sometimes people get an offer you know, maybe a verbal offer over the phone. And then a couple of days later, they get the official offer. And then maybe a week or more later, they accept. Right. Right. And so when, what we write down is the is the accepted offer. So that's why I think the duration is one of those things that nobody thinks about too much. Yeah. Right. They just look at the salary numbers yeah. and that's it. Yes. Uh, but but again, in my opinion, if you just look at the salary numbers, you, you can definitely be misled into one of those like two day training again, extreme. Yeah, for sure. Right. For sure. But how long are you job hunting for? Job hunting for a year? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if that's better. Yeah. I mean, you do have to be pretty careful um, just looking at other institutions, just making sure, like, what does that mean? If it does say, for example, two-day training, 
what does that mean for you? When will you get the job? That's a really great point. And I just appreciate the transparency around this. That's great. So moving on, I do have a question about the US salaries. I noticed that's been highlighted on the page. How about the grads that received job offers in non-US countries? Would you be able to sort of share a little bit more about this? Yeah. So the vast majority of non-US capstone participants have been in Canada and UK. Yes. And then outside of those two countries, there are individuals here and there. That's why on the salaries page, I've sort of aggregated Canada and UK together. And the reason why I did that, one is to give a higher number so that, you know, we're not revealing anyone's individual salary. Yes. And also the higher the number, the, the more accurate, you know, the, the averages yes. can be trusted. Sure. And also two country salaries for capstone are, are quite similar. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's why, you know, and I've seen salaries in both of those locations kind of go up over the years. Yes. Yeah. I haven't reported any other locations outside the U.S. Mostly because we, we just don't have that many, first of all. Yeah. And, and second of all, I just haven't detected any similarities to sort of aggregate them together. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. Like I know we've had one or two capstone students in China, one in India. Yes. I don't know if it does anybody any good to like average those three together. Yeah. You know, we have like one person in Australia, yes. one person in Sweden, <laughs> that type of thing. So other than UK and Canada, there just haven't been a high enough number to really produce anything that's meaningful for anyone. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And especially with law school, I mean, most of the capstone students are from the US and that would make sense. Put attention to who it's usually for. So, but just looking at 2021 specifically. Would you be able to sort of share a summary of that year and just some of the things that are worth noting about it? Yeah, sure. The funny thing is, I remember doing a like a recession talk when yes. COVID first came about. Yes. I think that was like late 2020, but it didn't really happen. And then 2020, I was like, OK, we're going to have a downturn in yeah. 2021. Right. Didn't really happen uh, for us. At least it didn't really happen. The numbers are really, really good. There's been several surprising results here, mostly on the good end. Mm -hmm. For example, 25% of US-based capstone graduates landed jobs with a base salary of 140 or higher, 25%. Wow. Wow. That's astounding. Yes. Uh, Not a number I had ever thought was possible, Uh especially in 2021, where I thought, you know, things were going to kind of go downturn a little bit. Amazing. 64% landed this is U.S. 64% landed roles with a salary of 120 or higher. That means most. That's great. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, it's really good. Yeah, that's putting it mildly. <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. And and the crazy thing is, you know, our enrollment has increased by a lot. We went from 34 capstone participants in 2020 to 71 in 2021. Yeah. And yet we're still seeing these types of numbers. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. And that's with, again, 98.5% you know, getting jobs in 180 days, yeah. right? So the vast majority do. Sure. And these are the numbers we're seeing. Yeah. So 2021 has been good. It's been a continuation of what we've been doing. Yes. And a continued validation of learning slowly. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Otherwise, why bother? Yeah. But yeah. It's been a good validation, I think. Yeah. It's a wonderful testament to the program and core and capstone combined and what it can give you. So looking back at all the years, is there any sort of trends that you've kind of noticed over the years of capstone students? I think the most glaring one for me is just seeing Canadian UK salaries rise. In the yeah. very beginning, I remember back in, you know, 2018 when we first accepted Canadian capstone students. And I remember studying salary reports from sort of like the top computer science departments. Because that's been sort of my guidance. And if anybody's listening from around the world, my general guidance has been if you look at the salaries from an 80th percentile computer science department, Mm -hmm. let's say undergraduate, that's roughly what we're able to hit, historically speaking. Right. Right. This is before COVID. So that's been a rough metric. Yes. And so when when we first looked at Canadian Capstone grads, we we did the same analysis there. Mm -hmm. And we were able to hit that, basically. And now it feels like Either we're surpassing that or just the market in general is recalibrated. Yeah. So in other words, CS grads are making more yeah. <laughs> as well. Right. Right. So I, I think in general, companies are just kind of moving to Canada, moving to UK, moving to Toronto, London, and driving up wages. In the US, salaries have come high too. You know, I, we did a breakdown of salaries over 140. And I remember um, when we segmented the salaries, right? Yes. I, I think the segments were like under 100, 100 to 120, 120 to 140, and 140 and higher. Yes. 
if you were to ask me, I don't know, two, three years ago, mm -hmm. I would have said these ranges probably are, you're going to have like one or two, you know, above 140, one or two below 100. Mm -hmm. The vast majority are going to be between 100 and 140, right? Yes. So it's been very, very surprising to see 2018, 6%. One salary was over 140. Right. 2019, two salaries were over 140. 2021, 15. Wow. Which is 25%. Yeah. As the percent is higher. That's right. Yeah. And by the way, I know we're jumping a gun here. We're going to talk about 2022 salaries, but 2022 is 28% so far. Wow. Yeah. How exciting. That's awesome. <laughs> and I, I look, full disclosure, my hunch is that this is probably as high as it's going to get. I can't imagine it getting higher. And I definitely don't want to set the expectation that you know, you're going to make over 140. But the fact that we can even go and compete for these types of salaries, I think is a hint mm. at the quality, right? Yes. The journey that everyone is going on here from core, from prep to core, to capstone. Sometimes you go through these assessments, you're like, where are we going? We're going over there. We're going to go compete for these types of things. Yes. <laughs> right? It's always great to have these sort of conversations because then you realize, oh, yeah, this is what I'm working towards, right? Really appreciate you sharing those trends. And yeah, my last question for you was about 2022, which was, would you be able to sort of give us any insight about 2022 salaries alike, or is it too early to say? It is early, but we've had two cohorts. And so how we report salaries too is a, is a little um weird in that like when we say 2022 salaries, it's actually not all accepted offers in 2022, right? Right. It is actually cohort based. Okay. So we have a January, May, and fall yes. cohort. Yes. We have three cohorts a year. Mm -hmm. And when we report 2021 salaries, for example, it is those three cohort salaries that we're reporting. Sure. Yeah. But the 2021 fall cohort start their job hunt in January of 2022. Wow. Okay. Yep. Okay. So 2021 salaries includes offers that are accepted in 2022. I see. Yeah. That okay. Sense, that makes sense. Right. Yep. And that's why we don't report numbers until like May or June when basically one's finished. Yes. So for 2022, we have two cohorts that graduated. We have one more cohort that is going to start their job hunt. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. In January. Yeah. Exciting. Yeah. So right now I have 42 accepted offers mm -hmm. in the U.S. to share and eight accepted offers from UK plus Canada mm -hmm. to share. So numbers really good. They're kind of what we expect now at this point. I feel like when I say these numbers now, people are like, yeah, whatever sounds right. <laughs> <laughs> But 42 U.S. offers average 127. Wow. Right above 127. Yes. Um, median is right there. Uh -huh. Our average and median are very, very similar. I know that's not maybe true for salaries like out in the wild, mm -hmm. but our capstone salaries, median average are very similar. So median is 128 above, just above 128. That's great. Average duration to accepted offer is 8.3 weeks, which is a little bit higher than last year. Last year was sure. seven weeks. Yes. Yes. Uh, this year so far, it's been eight weeks and this number is going to go up probably. <laughs> Although we'll see what the fall cohort does in January. But market is tightening. So I definitely do right. expect this number to go up. Right. And then I've already mentioned this part. 28%, 12 people mm -hmm. have accepted offers over 140. Wow. Right. 140 or higher. Yeah. As base. Yes. As base. Right? Amazing. So really strong numbers. And I think, again, given the market conditions, that's a small victory. Right. Yeah. So we'll see what 2023 holds. But, you know, so far we're doing great. Yeah. UK, Canada, eight accepted offers there. Average salary, 91,000 USD. That's great. Just above 91,000 USD. Yes. The duration here is a little bit shorter, 7.3 weeks. Okay. Um, cool. So I don't, I don't know that it's statistically significant, but it's 7.3 weeks versus US, which is 8.3 weeks so sure, far. Sure. Sure. I mean, these are amazing numbers. And to me, it just sounds like over and over again that law school is the place to be right now. <laughs> There we have it. Capstone graduate results are one of the things that makes law school so special. So it's really great to be able to understand in more detail. Thank you so much, Chris, for sharing your insight on capstone salaries and the new page. Is there anything else that you'd like to talk about in regards to capstone salaries? I think that's it. I mean, the article sort of highlights uh, a lot of the ideas and deconstructs it better, I yes. think, in more detail sure. than this conversation. Yep. So the one thing I wanted to just talk about is sometimes people will talk about getting these high salary numbers and talk about it from a perspective of there's two ways of doing it. One is sort of like gaming it a little bit, mm -hmm. what we talked about mm -hmm. already, you know, decreasing the denominator, increasing the criteria for graduation, et cetera. Yes. The other way to these really high numbers is just to be super selective. Right. Right. Just only select 
and therefore you're going to get high numbers. Yes. And I do think that sometimes when you see high numbers coming out of Capstone, people feel like that second way is happening. It's like you're, you're just liking the best. So sometimes I'll get questions like, oh. well, out of the people who make over 140, how many of them have computer science degrees? Ah, uh, I see. Or yes. college degrees yeah. or PhDs mm-hmm. or, you know, how awesome were they? Right. right. Again, they're trying to disambiguate how much of it was launch school I see. versus how much of it was them and just try to separate the two, uh-huh. right? Because I'm not coming with a PhD in anything. Sure. Can I still do this? Sure. And I want to just address that because I get that question so much. Sure. Yeah. And I just want to say that historically in every other education institution, that's how it works. Right. They select yes. based on experience or credentials or, you know, PhD or something that's unchangeable about your past. Right. Right. You select for that. Mm-hmm. You're going to get a super high placement rate. Mm-hmm. You're going to get high salaries, mm-hmm. of course. Right. And I think the one thing that makes law school different is that we select based on a, just a different attribute, which is work ethic over a long period of time. Mm-hmm. It's not something that's unchangeable prior to coming to law school. You can actually mold this attribute while you're at law school. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Like you can't change the fact that you don't have a PhD. Yes. I guess you can get a PhD. Yeah. <laughs> you always could do that. <laughs> that's yeah. not what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but if you think about it, it, it kind of conveys the same message, which is like, I can do a lot of grunt work over years. Yes. Right. Yeah. So the difference between law school and I think other sort of institutions that select very heavy for credentials, we can do that too. Mm. But I don't see any point in doing that. What I want to do is instead select on work ethic. Right. Select on perseverance. Yes. Select on your ability to perform well. Yeah. Over a long period of time. Absolutely. How do we do that? Well, we, we want you to work mm. through some curriculum exercises, do some interviews. Yeah. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> yes. A little bit familiar. <laughs> yeah. So we want to see you in action, right? So it doesn't matter if you were previously, you know, janitor. <laughs> Or an astronaut, it really doesn't matter. No. Um, it's just, can you do these things? You can have the best credentials in the world and not do these things. Yes. And we won't select you. Yes. Right? There's no point of having another super selective elite institution. Right. Yeah. That only serves the top 1%. Like, yeah. th- that's not the goal, right? The goal is to do something that's different. Yeah. That really yeah. we haven't seen yet. And that's serving an audience based on, in my opinion, really what employers want. Yes. Work ethic. Yeah. Over a long period of time. Yeah. It's as simple as that. Work ethic over a long period of time. Yeah. Uh, That's great. Yeah. I mean, it brings so much more clarity to core curriculum. And it's just like you are learning work ethic. You don't always know that when you're going through it. But yeah, that's that's absolutely true. Yeah. If you have it, great. No problem. (laughs) (laughs) Just go. If you don't have it, that's why you should be here. Right. 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 That's why a mastery based learning program is somehow a three or four or five or six month class mm-hmm. or boot camp going to solve that problem. Mm-hmm. So, you know, at the end of the day, um, I think it's okay to say, yeah, law school capstone is selective, but not based on immutable historical attributes. Sure. Yeah. It's selective based on your work. Yeah. Over a prolonged period of time. Yeah, absolutely. Which is a core curriculum. Yeah. 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 Very insightful. Very interesting. Just thank you so much for sort of sharing that and shedding light on, you know, what we're doing here. I really, really appreciate it. So I do have one extra question because this is the the final episode of the season. Is there anything else that you'd like to sort of share or talk about just in regards to ending the season? I don't have anything major to share other than that the numbers that we talked about today, Mm -hmm. I think, again, it's validation that what we're doing works. Yes. And one of the things that I see a lot, especially because it's a long process, there's a lot of people doubting themselves. Yeah. Doubting what we're doing here, Mm -hmm. doubting their ability to do this thing. Mm -hmm. And I just want people to know that it's almost impossible to do the wrong thing when you're doing something like the core curriculum. Yeah. When you're mastering fundamentals. Yeah. When you're taking time to explain problems, deconstruct problems. Yes. Everything we ask you in the core curriculum. I feel like it's it's nearly impossible for that to be incorrect. Mm, that's true. Yeah. And so to set aside some of the doubt and the anxiety and to just realize that we're going to aim, you know, at that percent of quality, yeah. whatever salary number that is. So work hard, be diligent, take care of each other, take care of yourself, take care of your health. Mm-hmm. Um there's no sense in like sacrificing health or mental health as well, right? Physical yes. health, mental health. Yes. It's a holiday season. 
It's okay to take a break. Mm -hmm. No worries, right? And I think 2023 numbers are going to look great. I think they're going to be wonderful. So, and then I think 2024 is going to be great too. So, yeah. you know, just good things are ahead if if you just learn well. I think that's the biggest takeaway. Yeah. We we do these numbers every year and I feel like there's always a little bit of anxiety from people in terms of like, oh, is good times over? Yes. Right? Yeah. The, for, the capsule formula is no longer going to work. Yes. Right? <laughs> or at least like, will it work for me? It'll work for others, but will it work for me? Right. And so it's like, Learn things well. As I always said, the magic happens in core, mm -hmm. not in capstone, mm -hmm. right? A uh, lot of good things in capstone, obviously. But if you're in core listening to it, which is probably the vast majority of people, just know that good things are ahead. Yeah, no, that's great. It's so reassuring, especially when you're in the in the middle of it. It's really great to hear. So I thank you so much for all your advice this season and just everything that you've shared so far on this episode. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Have a good holidays, everybody. Yes. And thanks for having me on. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed the final episode of the season. As for me, this is actually my last episode as podcast host. And I just want to say thank you to Chris for giving me the opportunity to contribute to Launch School in this way. I so enjoyed interviewing some amazing people too. And thank you to you for listening. I hope you found all the episodes have been a part of interesting and helpful along your Launch School journey. But not to worry, I won't be too far away. I'll still be helping to make these podcast episodes sound great from behind the scenes and continue to work at Launch School. And now we turn our attention to some final announcements of the year, along with some quick reminders about the latest events at Launch School. So first off, season's greetings. During the holiday season, all TAs and staff will have reduced hours from December 17th to January 2nd. For more information, please read our winter holiday forum announcement, which I will link for you in the show notes. We have just wrapped up another impressive set of capstone presentations from our latest cohort. If you are not able to attend, rest assured, presentations are recorded and will be available in the video section on the Launch School website. These TAs have been with us for a little while, but I'd still like to welcome Jack and Allison. You might see them answering your forum questions or giving you feedback and code reviews. And if you're listening and would also like to be a TA, we have a sign-up form, which I will link for you in the show notes. And our latest peer-led seminar, Six Languages in Six Weeks, was a great success. Everyone who participated learned the basics of IO, Prolog, Scala, Erlang, Clojure, and Haskell. We're always running peer-led seminars, so be on the lookout for the next one. And that's it from me. Happy holidays, everyone. Have a wonderful, restful winter break. Everything mentioned here today can be found in the show notes on podcast.launchschool.com. And if you have an idea for an interview or anything podcast related, you can reach out to us at our URL, launchschool.com forward slash podcast hyphen requests.